Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, first of all, I want to share with you a very, very short testimony. Someone was coming in to uh, the prayer service this morning, and they, the thought came to them, where is everybody? They didn't hear anyone. And they thought, is nobody here? And they stopped at these, coming up the back stairs at the top, and they saw that there was people here, but everyone was silent. And they stopped and they said that the Lord spoke to them and said, they are waiting for me. And I thought that was just really a special thing to share with you all is the blessing from the Lord there. So we have before us that our business meeting is back open here for one topic, and that is the, yes, uh, did, you also have the minutes have been given to you, uh, take a a motion to accept the minutes uh, as they are printed. Um, Jay moves and Mark Nunn seconds. Is there any discussion, any changes, anything we need to do to the minutes? Seeing none. And for those of you who are online, I want to thank you and I want to again apologize for at times moving too rapidly. But I want to, uh, this is about Kirtland. Hold on just a moment, please. Sorry. This Brian? meeting that are We are approved and we have we'll be going to Kirtland September twentieth through the twenty second. So uh, huh? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, absolutely. So whew, very, very 
very thankful. We have uh, resolution number one that is before us, and I want to just ask for a privilege. I had someone give me uh, it. We did not vote, did we, on, on the minutes. Thank you. All those in favor of the minutes, please show your hands. Any opposed? Kevin, are we online too? Okay, uh, we will get the uh, minutes uh, posted for those that are online. If there ends up being something that you see that is incorrect, please uh, notify me and we will uh, confirm uh, any corrections that need to be made, but at this point we'll consider the minutes approved as written. So I would like to uh, just tell you, uh, someone had given me a copy of resolution number one and they highlighted a, a number of things that were just grammatical, like something should say has instead of have, are should be is instead of are, if it's okay with you, I'm not going to present that to you, but before we publish anything, if we'll go ahead and make those corrections. If without objection, yeah, Brother Paul. It's something along that line that, that I noticed. In the first resolve, it says conference restoration elders. The next one says elders conference. The next one says CRE. It's kind of confusing. If uh, throughout this uh, document, I could just see a conference First time, conference restoration elders, then parentheses, CRE, and then after that, CRE. That way we know we're all talking about the same organization. Thank you very much. We'll make that correction also. Okay. So at this point, what we had printed and given to you um, included all the amendments of yesterday. And so it is on the floor. Um, so what would you like to do? Uh, if there's any other discussion, we'll do that now. And if not, we're going to call for a vote. Seeing none. Are we online now, Kevin? Okay. Nope. So, you know, we're online. Everything's good. Um, seeing none, then we're going to call for the vote. Those in favor of resolution number one, as amended, printed for you, please show your hands. Any opposed? We have one online, voted no. Can you consent to the whole?
It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. I appreciate the spirit in which you've gathered. Dad? There were some that abstained. Okay. They abstained means that they will support whatever the whole was. And so every vote, the one that was on here that did not, uh, sometimes we get uh, mix up on whether it's a yes or a no and there's no response and he didn't understand who the no was and so we are past so what an answer to prayer thank you all very much we have no other business to handle So, Brother Paul. I had an email today from uh, Sister Cherise Morris in Australia. <laughs> She's the granddaughter of Ron and Jan Mitchell in Sydney. Those that might have been there know them. She says she had tried to get online and it either wasn't picked up or whatever. And she just wanted to say good day to all you guys. Well, thank you. And we. Brothers, we've had uh, seven countries participating, and we have had some from Australia. So uh, for those that are participating, we are very, very, very grateful. We've also had many, many from within the United States, and uh, we've labored together, and the Lord truly has blessed us. You heard the announcement about when Kirtland is. And uh, also, I wanted to make sure it don't go without just get lost in some of the papers that you are given. Brother Mark Nunn, and I'm sorry, Mark, if you didn't want your name mentioned, but Mark had an experience during the night, and there was a copy that was put in there in your uh, stuff that we handed out to you today. And uh, I think it's something we certainly need to consider as we go forward. Brother, and there's a tremendous, we have a tremendous path before us. And uh, there's one thing that I've been asked, especially outside the center place. They want to know what's happening as far as reconciliation in the center place. And I'm very, very grateful that Jason, Jason took a big responsibility in Coming on the domestic outreach, he's going to take the center place region here. And I'm going to specifically ask you to hold him up in prayers because there's a lot of work that needs to be done here in bringing the center place together. The CMRB branches, the POZ branches, and most of all, that just bring our saints before the face of the Lord. And there's a great deal of work that needs to be done. But brothers and sisters, we are moving that way. We, uh, Brother Vin, or My Marlon, Marlon, Gwen. Nope, go ahead. Please do. We're thankful you're here, brother. Uh, I was at the uh, <clears throat> Book of Mormon Foundation at noon, and I brought over two cases of Book of Mormons and a case of the overviews, 120, free of charge for anybody that's going out. We're going to have a going for service coming up. Uh, take what you need. Uh, if you need more, we'll figure that out. But I just thought I would, since we're going to have that service today, bring those over and and feel free to help yourself. They're down on the table by the library. Thank you. You know, I remember when my daughter was in the uh, Book of Mormon internship and they were all given one extra Book of Mormon and their responsibility was sometime during that internship, they had to give that Book of Mormon away. My challenge to each of us, take a Book of Mormon, find somebody to give it away to. I'm going to do something here that uh, I don't know that we've ever done, but I feel very much 
directed for us to do this. We've talked about common consent. We've labored together. We've been patient with one another. We've been prayerful for one another. We have times that the elders have voted on different things. I want to just share with you that I'd like to have a vote for everybody. I want to ask you, will you consent to everything that has taken place this week? If you were willing, would you show your hands for everybody to vote? Not just the elders. Open up for everyone. Including online. Is there any opposed? There is none. Thank you. Huh? Arthur. Gosh, Arthur. Brother, I don't know what to do. I've tried. That's all I can do. I've tried. I'd like for... Uh, where is uh, Tom? Tom? Uh, oh, before we get to that, Tom... If you don't mind, we asked, there were several that asked about the, uh, the sharing the uh, Ten Commandments with Ten Fingers. And uh, we had some handouts on that earlier. And I asked uh, Jim, Bonnie, thank you, <laughs> to uh, come and share with you how to do that. Because this next section here is about missionary outreach and being able to reach out to people. And you heard some of the testimony with that. And so I asked them to be able to do that first. And I apologize, Tom. I hope that's okay with you. But I'd, I'd like for them to be able to share that and uh, for us to learn that as we get an opportunity to share with somebody. And directly after that, we're going to head into domestic outreach and the other missionary reports that are happening. So I want to thank you all very much. Chris? Yes, please. Brothers and sisters, as a teacher in the church, part of my duty is watching over the congregation, watching over the church. And one thing I've noticed is that reconciliation, both abroad here in the congregation, in the individual congregations, one-on-one -on -one reconciliation is the core of it. And the core of reconciliation is that love. We are told to have that love, that charity, that is the foundation of what we are to have within us, within everything. Within every decision we make, we have made tremendous steps this week, tremendous steps. And I encourage us to continue to make tremendous steps. But we need to focus on reconciliation with our brothers, with our sisters, with our outreach, with how we approach those that we work with, with everything in our daily lives needs to be brought about with the thought of reconciliation. Thank you very much, Christopher, and thank you for your ministry this week. Okay, Jim, Bonnie, appreciate you guys coming and sharing. Jim and said he was going to come up here and do this. Okay, super. Kevin, you're coming up to set this up. And Kevin, yes, it's Mark Nunn. Yeah, you're in trouble now, mister. <laughs> yes, thank you. And you 
heard what Paul said. How do you turn this on? Right. And my mouse. Where's my mouse? Uh, he has it. I thought maybe the cat got it. That took me a minute. While they're getting set up, I might tell you, I was kidding the other day. I was doing the Biden walk. Well, I, I, know, I was notified about four to six weeks ago that I have Parkinson's disease. That's caused my speech to blur a little bit, and of course my walk. But Brian and Joel Loving administered to me the other night, and I walked a lot better right after that. And then Joel spoke to me and said, I'll probably carry the thorn in my side for a few years, but it'll be a progressive moving back to my youth. <laughs> Wouldn't that be exciting? Well, let me ask you this. How many of you believe in Zion? Ah, 100%, see that? Where's, where's, I, oh, there he is, 100%. How many of you want to live in Zion when it's redeemed, or as it's being redeemed? How many you want to live during a thousand years? How many you want to reign with Christ during a thousand years? Well, that's really what this is all about. The whole church, Christ's death and resurrection, is about us, ourselves, being in the thousand years with him to teach during the thousand year reign and to reign with him during the thousand years. We have to get ready now. We have to be prepared now. We've got to learn how to teach, how to be valiant in our testimony because it's those who are valiant in testimony that will be with the Lord in the thousand years. So I've been doing this since about 1968. So I've learned a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes too. Now I'm shaking like a leaf. I promised uh, Brian I wouldn't be over two hours. <laughs> <laughs> now what I want you to do if you would where's my copy of that I haven't memorized this myself what I want you to do is read the back of this first where it says I believe do you, or do you believe on the back side do you believe this is directed toward Protestant people. Do you believe all these things? So, do you, you know, you believe in repentance and so forth. But look, then I have a quote from Ether, from John, and from 1 John. But look at the note at the bottom. Well, wait a minute. Um, the last believe. Do you believe that polygamy, adultery, and fornication are against God's laws and are serious sins that need to be repented of? I ask that to all Protestant people. Now look what it says on the call out at the bottom note. All these beliefs are taught both in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is a companion book to the Bible 
and that it contains a mixture of stories and writings recorded by early prophets to help us learn about Jesus Christ who came in the flesh and his dealings with mankind. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. We have given thousands of these away in all kinds of situations. And I'm going to tell you quickly some of the ones we've done. Then my wife's going to share some testimonies. Is this first slide ready? Is it up there? This was a young girl. You see, I just taught her the Ten Commandments. Maybe I should turn this thing on. Ah, it changed. This is my wife teaching at one. The, anybody heard of the Reawaken American Tours? That's not Karen. Well, that's Karen Blakeney. Well, tell them about the Reawaken American Tours. Come on up here. That's Karen Blakeney. Okay. We were one of the Reawaken American Tours here. There was a, and they're still going on, I think, in a lot of the cities all over the nation. Uh, we were acquainted with this through our, one of our daughters, um, and uh, she went in as a uh, news person, and uh, she got us in. Uh, we were in the vendor venue, although we weren't selling anything, and that's made us unique. And so I could step out in the aisle and say, um, we don't sell anything here. Uh, we give everything away. And so we, we got a lot of people interested just saying that. But the Reawaken America Tours is uh, very patriotic. Across America, they have... Um, I think we went to six or seven of them, and everything from, um, we went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, to Phoenix, Arizona, Myrtle Beach, where we had a really good experience, but I don't think... Yeah, go ahead and tell them that, what are you talking about? Okay, um, at Myrtle Beach, we uh, were able to uh, get acquainted with a production manager for the chosen, um, and their their studio is located in Poolville, Texas, and they decided to have a one day event. It was a festival, and they called it. It was it was on July the third, twenty twenty two, and uh, they were going to have a patriotic type festival, uh, for Christians and everything, and. Uh, they were way out, this place is way out in the boondocks uh, in Texas, nothing around them, but this uh, studio is built out there, and uh, it has a number of buildings on it and everything, and uh, what did you say, sorry? Short yes. it. okay, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. We were... <laughs> We, were, we had our trailer out there. We had a, had a big trailer that had in it uh, screens to show videos on and do different things. And uh, this particular uh, time, we were, it was close to closing time on the day of the event. It was only a one-day thing. And so uh, we were talking in there to a couple um, and Jim said, Have, did you know, because he was witnessing about the church to them, and he said, did you know that Joseph Smith was not a Mormon? And uh, the couple was surprised. They were interested in what he was saying. And so he said, um, I'm going to show you this movie. It's only five minutes long. And so they sat down, and he started showing it. And there was... Practically everybody was leaving, and so we only had this couple there, and we thought that's what would it be. Well, about two minutes into the film, the video, in walks this man and woman, and they wanted to uh, sit there and listen. The man was standing up in the corner, and his wife sat down, and as soon as she saw Joseph Smith, on the screen, she got up and took off real fast. 
But he stood there, and he watched, and he watched the whole thing. It was about five minutes long. And then he said, uh, I didn't know Joseph Smith wasn't a Mormon. And uh, we said, well, uh, no, he wasn't. And uh, he said, do you to teach, teach the Book of Mormon here, don't you? And we said, yes, but not unless we, you know, we're talking to people mostly about the finger commandments. And uh, so he liked that. But he said, you know, I want you to leave. And we said, okay. And it was almost closing time anyway. So, yes. So, anyway, he started preaching to us in full Baptist mode right there about once saved, always saved, and a lot of other things, he said. And you couldn't get a word in edgewise. We just waited a second, and then Jim said, um, have you ever read the Book of Mormon? And he said, well, no, but I have read the Koran. And he said, I read it to counter the, you know, the, Koran, the Koran. And so Jim said, well, uh, how about if we give you a Book of Mormon, would you read it? And he said, well, I could read it. I read the Koran. And he said, uh, by the way, I own this place. He owned the studio. His name was Mr. Lane. Uh, his wife's name is Tammy Lane, and there's Tammy Lane Productions. That's one of the things that's on there, on that grounds. Uh, you've heard of Angel Studios and all those other things. They're all there, too. But anyway, Jim took out a Book of Mormon, the covenant version of the Book of Mormon, and uh, we also gave him um, other sheep, that booklet, Other Sheep, and we gave him the names of Christ in the Indian tribes, you know, that brochure, and uh, put it all in a bag for him. And uh, he said, well, thank you. He said, uh-uh, this is really nice. And Jim said to him, uh, you know, I think you're an honest man. We like what you're doing here. And uh, he said, I think because you said you're going to read this book, I believe you will. You gave your word. So he put him in a box. So <laughs> he took that bag, and uh, then he left. And Jim tried to follow up with him later on, but couldn't get through, except finally got to his secretary and... Uh, she said that she would tell him that you had, he had sent a, uh, an email and all of that. Now, also, okay, he thinks I'm taking too long. Can you believe when I, we got married, she was bashful? <laughs> I I, I, I'm going to give you another chance here in a couple of minutes. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll do the Ten Commandments for you on my fingers in just a minute and a half it'll take. The reason they came in the booth because outside of the booth, we gave them the Ten Commandments. We did the finger commandments. We gave them a coin and said, would you like to come in? We can teach you some more. The Ten Commandments. Do you know the Ten, Com Ten Commandments was taught in the Garden of Eden? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. All of that was taught in the Garden of Eden. The Ten Commandments was taught in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants. The Ten Commandments is an eternal law. It's not a mosaic law. It's an eternal law. So here, uh, my wife is at another place teaching the Ten Commandments. There's Karen again. Everywhere we go, we teach the Ten Commandments. Now, this is really fun. Just a few weeks ago, we were on a mission. And we stopped at a filling station at one of those truck stops, and this family was in there, and I saw all these children, and they looked like they're different races and so forth. So I walked up to them, and I said, uh, I have a feeling you're a Christian family. I said, yes, we are. I get so emotional with this stuff anymore. Look at this smile on their faces. We taught them all the Ten Commandments, gave them all a coin. What a beautiful, beautiful contact we had. Now here's a little girl. You can see in, in different countries, you gotta baptize where you can. Baptize this little girl. Now here we are, uh, this store, where were we? 
It's an Amish store. Where were we? Oh, yes. Uh, Trenton, Missouri. Trenton, Missouri. Unfortunately, my nephew, being a member of the church, committed murder with a ball bat when he was 16, been in prison for 35 years. So we went up to see him, and uh, he had converted to the Muslim faith while we were there. Because he's out of prison now. Just got out of prison. Been in 35 years. But now he's full-blown Muslim. So he has to be careful what food he buys. So he took us to this Amish store and says, Bonnie, <laughs> teaching the lady the Ten Commandments. It's so easy to do once you learn them, but you got to learn them in your mind. you got to know what they mean. The other day we were, uh, we were in a hotel. <laughs> See, I can't even remember anything. What was your name again? We were in Oklahoma. Yeah, we were in Oklahoma. Well, actually for our 31st, no. our 62nd wedding anniversary. We were married on March 31st. Do you know what she said the next morning after we were married? April Fool's. Well, we've been fools for each other ever since. <laughs> but anyway, I, I've been in India a number of times, so I was pretty guessed that these people were from India. So I walked over to their table, and I said, uh, are you folks from India? And he said, yes, we are. I figured they were Hindu. And so I said, well, what is your faith? We're Christian pastors. We're here for a national, international pastor's day. You see what they have in their hands? They all got Ten Commandment coins. I wonder how they got those. They were thrilled to death. They said, man, we're going to take these back and we're going to teach this to our children. I want you all to learn these Ten Commandments. I have coins and handouts. You got the handouts. I got a coin for everybody in this room. We buy about a thousand coins at a time. It's so much fun. Now, this young woman, she's from India. We had been there three times in India, and she n never was baptized. And I kept wondering, because we had baptized other people while we were there. Well, the night before we left, she came up to me and said, I want to be baptized before you go. I said, there's elders right here. Ask them to baptize you. I'm sure they will, because we had to catch a plane the next morning. So I want you to. <laughs> we had to go to the Corps of Engineer Lake at night, crawl, climb over the fence, and get baptized in this mucky, terrible water. We pushed everything out of the way. <laughs> baptized her, crawled back over the fence, got in a rickshaw, all dripping wet. But oh, so what a pleasure to baptize her. We taught her the commandments the first time we saw her. Here is uh, those two, what's their names in Michigan? Some of you probably know them. Oh, Janine and... No, the no, two. Oh, no. Uh, Riley and... Um, oh, What's their names? Name. You know they go out every Saturday, no matter rain, shine, whatever. They love the Ten Commandments. See, he's doing it right there. They've been spit on. They've been cursed. They've been kicked. They go out no matter what, but they witness everywhere they go. Am I time up? I'm getting close. I learned from George Gross, George Medford, George Knotts, and George Thomas how to witness. Those guys, I tell you, I've been out in the field with those guys. You can stop at a filling station, a grocery store, whatever, they're witnesses all the time. George Knotts had those coins he'd buff, and God we trust. No matter where he was, he said, you've been blessed today. Well, while he's handing them a coin, they're obviously going to take it. Uh, how much fun to be with those guys. I have a couple more pictures, and we'll be done here. Okay, aren't you going to let me get Yes, I wanted to get through these first. Now why isn't it moving? Somebody help me out here. Well, I'll do it this way, maybe. Another little boy. They, we were in the ghettos in Indiana at that time. Oh, this is one I wanted to show you. This is when I started teaching this. It's a joke, folks. You can laugh. <laughs> anyway, my wife is going to take... I'll show you. Now, let me say this. You have to learn them on your fingers. 
You really do. You got so we're going to play kindergarten now. Because you want to be able to say when you're with your children or your family or friends, no matter where you are, what's number six? They'll look at their hands. Oh, thou shalt not kill. What's number seven? They look at their hands, married, everybody else, no adultery. Learn them on your fingers and you'll know them. And it's so much fun. And no matter where you are, you know what I got in my pocket? I carry them all the time with me everywhere I am. Grocery stores, filling station, whatever. Okay, she's going to teach you the commands will be done. Thank you so much for letting us come. What a privilege. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you got to do them with her now. Got to do them with her. I can do this in a minute and a half. Um, I can do it real fast if you want me to. Um, one God, no other gods before me. Number two is a pair of scissors, you're cutting up idols. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, nor bow down and worship them. Number three, think of W for words. Right? This is the words of your mouth. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number four, now I, I say a family of four going to church. You remember four, he does the, the church... But I do this because it's quicker, and it's four. You see, four, four kids, four people going to church, okay? And the word remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days do all your labor. The seventh is the day that we rest. We don't hire people to work for us on that day. And uh, number, now the next one is uh, number five. Honor your father and your mother. You're saluting them. Okay. Number six, thou shalt not murder. We say murder. Okay. This is a, could be a knife or a gun, but the trigger's down because you've got to have six fingers. Okay, number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Husband and wife, away from all others, faithful to each other. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. In some countries, if you steal, you get your fingers cut off or your hand. So we keep two fingers down to remind us not to steal. Number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, I'm doing that right now because you think I don't have a thumb on this hand, but I really do. <laughs> and number ten, thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. And this is the way you do it, so you can get it. Okay? See how quick that is? I could actually do it real fast if I wanted to, and I've, I've told people that when we were in the Reawake America tours, I'd go out in the aisle and say, I've got something you need to see, and it's all free, and you get something too. And so I'd get people coming in. Those tours, by the way, they went all over America. They had a lot of speakers all day. They start at 10 o'clock in the morning, end at 7, and the, the, each speaker has about 15 or 20 minutes apiece, and they're on all different subjects, patriotism, uh, medicine, pol politics, um, uh, what else? Lots of things, and that's what it was. That's what it was. And then all around the auditorium that we was in were the booths, and we were in one of those booths. Thank you. Don't you just love my bashful wife? <laughs> 62 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay. Now, my Biden approach yes. getting off this stand. Yep. He'll need some help. It's nothing against Biden now. It's, it's me.
place, but more importantly, what our expectations, what our needs and desires are in the mission field. And we, we, we kind of started because I'm, I drew the short straw, straw so I'm the, the guy that sort of coordinates um, with Frank Dippel, the domestic outreach. But we're also going to share um, some things on international if you want to. I only have, besides Brian just now, one person that it asked to speak. There he is. Hey, Sean. I'll share really quickly about um, the Great Lakes area because that's uh, where I'm at. That's my area. And it's a wonderful place. There's wonderful folks. I'm really blessed. I have two families that I kind of uh, work from their homes or houses. I have Jay and Kathy Havener who live, you don't live in Oakwood, you live in or Oxford. That's it. There's all these little towns. There's like a million towns with lakes and they have these names and I haven't got them down yet. And I also work with uh, uh, Tom and Janine Essenmacher uh, out of their home. I've spent a lot of time there this summer and, and they're kind of the central Michigan and Gladwin. And um, um, it's been really great. I'm excited. Last year, we got to go um, to the first, and I know, first regional conference that the Saints gathered, which was wonderful. And uh, uh, we're going to do that again this year. And I've been invited, and I'm taking a young man with me, Caleb Pickett, who has to be dating Sean's daughter. And uh, Caleb is a very solemn young man. I met him several years ago in camp, and he kept asking me, I hear you're going on a mission trip. Can I go? I said, well, yeah, we'll, when, we'll find a place for you to go. And so he's attending. I bought the tickets. He's flying with me up to the conference. We're going to be staying at Jane Cathy's and attend the conference. We're then going to go and, and witness and, and uh, share with the saints at Garden City. So that'll it'll be a great opportunity. Some of the things that um, are some um, opportunities there and some challenges, kind of give you an outline for what you could share when you come up briefly, is some of the opportunities, as you may know, Michigan was a huge breadbasket of the restoration. It's huge. And there are still several branches there, but of course, not as many. We're talking about um, now Community of Christ, and a lot of those folks, the church, the Community of Christ is kind of just abandoned. Uh, one wonderful testimony, I was just on, te I'm, on I'm texting every day. Janine, like, texts me every day. She's probably watching right now, and it's really wonderful. And Tom, but especially Janine, because we're both kind of mouthy. Oh, I, she's not mouthy. I'm mouthy, but we communicate a lot together. And uh, that was bad. I know she's watching. So there's a, there's a, there's a community of Christ church um, that doesn't do a lot. Um, I think they even have a female pastor, which, you know, wouldn't be really pleasant for most of us. Um, but they don't worship a lot, and so, but they're interested in the Book of Mormon and other things that they're not really teaching there, and so they're having classes at night together. Um, what, what's, what's, what's wonderful in many ways in Michigan is in some ways there's a, um, an openness toward worshiping together in the different factions, is not my favorite word, but different groups of the saints that work together, whether that be restoration branches, whatever that means, um, JCRB folks, remnant folks, COC folks. Um, in some ways, there's a great opportunity for folks simply because they're so scattered to do things together. There's also the challenges, and that is because we all know, folks, as we, this, there are some differences of opinion on these things, and so that makes it challenging. Uh, um, I was in, um, I, I, I mentioned the other night, I flew back from the Philippines. I went straight to Michigan and went to St. John's and those folks are great. They, they witness on the sidewalks and the streets. They're very open to everybody's ministry and they're just, Riley's just wonderful, right? And I got to share with them. They're very open. I also was up in far north Michigan at Atlanta and Harry Hyde and Sue, his wife, and they're wonderful. And I stayed in their home. They're wonderful people. They're not so open, right? And that's okay. I mean, maybe not that they're open because he's, he's very diligent. And um, to give you an idea, I was there to, what? Very cautious. Guess the word, cautious. Um, Ron was up there, and Ron shared, and, and it was great. Um, but they're very diligent. Um, Harry's the only elder like for miles and miles, basically in northern Michigan. I arrived to preach the next day, and he said, you want to visit? I said, absolutely. And I, I take up my clothes and put this bedroom. He said, this is your bathroom. And he said, you have five minutes. It's kind of like being in Africa with Eric. When he comes in the morning, he says, we're leaving. It's not a would you like to go, we're leaving. And we visited all night long 
till it was dinner time, like eight o'clock, and we had dinner, and we went back out for two more visits, and after church, we drove clear across the state for two more visits. It was wonderful. So the, as in any domestic field, there are saints that are scattered, and that geography is challenging, very challenging, especially in Michigan, and not just Michigan, but we've been, I've been with Tom into Canada, um, and my area also includes, and never been there, we have saints we know in Wisconsin, we need to go see, right, to come back. We have saints that we haven't even talked to yet in North and South Dakota, so the, the field is ripe. But we go, right? So that's my simple report. Um, it's been wonderful. Um, just... You know what, we, we did, we did, Debbie and I are up there and we've done several things with Janine and Tom who we just fell in love with immediately. I, um, I got their name from Frank Dipple and I called him and we gave because um, just the fact that we're with those, Frank, uh, with Tom and, and Janine, just that fact is that saints witnessing together, which is just marvelous. So I will, I will then uh, vacate this for Sean. Sean's going to share, I think, Are you in charge up here? Are you in charge? Come up here. I know he's the big dog. He's going to get his due. So I think uh, Sean wants to share about Uganda. And then we'll go and we'll, we'll get back to Brian's going to end this anyway. Sorry about that. I just thought domestic outreach, Maine being a state of the United States, it's domestic. What was I thinking? So, um, Thank you guys for giving me some time in regards to talking about Uganda. Um, I just got back from Uganda on uh, March 21st, and um, we had a, a wonderful time there. Unfortunately, we were only able to stay there for a couple weeks, um, and we got a lot of work done there, fortunately. Um, if you don't know anything about Uganda, Uganda, a couple years ago, um, had, one, had two branches, and then one of the branches, because of a uh, property dispute, had to dissolve and um, went down to one branch. Well, in the last two years, the Lord's work has really exploded there, and there, is, there was five missions. Now there's um, one branch, one branch in process, or one mission becoming, becoming a branch, or in process of becoming a branch, and four missions currently. Um, so we've got... Basically, one branch, which is, um, um, oh man, Boomigini, yes. The Boomigini branch is having to support all the work that's spread out throughout the country from Entebbe, uh, Kampala area, all the way to Mbali. And, and there's um, Iganga, Kadebidi, um, and Muyuge, and a couple of others that I probably haven't remembered, so my brothers online will understand if I didn't get them all, but um, the point is, is that the work is really exploding in Uganda, and if it wasn't for the efforts of the people in Kenya, Eric and his brothers and sisters in Kenya taking the gospel out to these areas, not just to Uganda, but also Rwanda and Tanzania and all these other places, the work wouldn't be where it is today. Um, I'd just like to share a couple of things with you. While I, while I got there, um, I was able to go to Bulumbali, and um, there was one lady that wanted to be baptized. The brothers in um, Bumagini were sharing with her and her family. She was part of a polygamous relationship, and she came out of that relationship, is remarried to one man, and um, decided to get married. Well, when I got there, I was not informed that she had lost her 11-year-old daughter three days prior. Um, but she still had hope. And she still had joy in her heart, knowing that the day would come that she would be reunited with her daughter. And that is the thing that the fullness of the gospel gives these people. It gives them a hope, even in their poverty, or even in their losses. And it, it's unfortunate that not everybody in that country, or even everybody in Africa, have the gift of the fullness of the gospel, but that's upon us to push that effort forward so that everybody can have the hope in Christ that we have. There's way too much um, 
how do I say this, profiteering in regards to the gospel in Africa. And when we come and we tell them we are not paid, that the priesthood that is their kin or their countrymen, they're not paid, they're shocked. When we, sit, when we stay at their homes and when we eat their food, they're shocked that we don't go to a resort or a hotel at night to spend our evenings, but that we sit with them, we eat with them, we commune with them, and we fellowship with them in their homes, and we eat of their food. And that's a, that's a great blessing to them. I never understood the importance of it until this last time I was there. And the people said, but you're eating mataki. And I looked at them and I said, that's what you guys eat? Well, that's what we eat. We're not the white man. And I said, but the Lord says there's no difference. There's no Jew or Gentile in the kingdom. And so they begin to understand that. So there is a great need right now, a financial need to make sure that the people in Uganda, not just, and I don't want to just talk about Uganda, all of Africa, they need to travel far places. And I traveled, this was the one time I had to take um, public transportation the whole time I was there. I've been spoiled many times with private transportation. Let me tell you, public transportation is terrible in, in Africa. It, it's 100 kilometers is about 65 miles-ish. It takes about four hours to get that far in public transportation. And I'm six foot four and about 112 kilos. The average African is about five foot eight, five foot nine, and about maybe 90, 70, 85 kilos. Would that be about right, Eric? No? Lower? <laughs> <laughs> so half my size, basically. So getting into that public transportation is really tight. But the th important part is, is that we're getting the gospel out. But we need help financially. We need our be to be able to give money to the people so that they can travel throughout that country. They don't have cars. People in Bumagini do not have electricity in their houses. They don't have indoor plumbing. That is not a luxury they, they have yet. They're hoping in a couple of years they might get electricity. But the point is, is that the way this gospel is going to grow, and it's, it's busting at the seams because one branch cannot possibly support five missions successfully over a protracted period of time. It just, it just won't work. There's only four priesthood that can travel. Three elders and one priest. So I have to make sure that they have money so that they can travel around the country to those five missions, and they want to do two missions per month throughout the year. It takes money, guys. And um, so I'm appealing to you, but not just on behalf of Uganda. Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Nigeria, Philippines, Philippines Seem. All of these places need money. And we have so many generous donors, so many people giving so much money. But here's the catch. A lot of the funds are restricted. So it can't go to pushing the message forward. There's a lot of different projects that are absorbing those funds that could go into the, the general budget that, aren't just, that just aren't making it because they're restricted. And I appreciate the generosity we have, to make, we have to make sure that the budgets of all of the countries that are benefiting from those monies that the saints give out of generosity are filled and that way the work can go forward. So thank you for your time, and God bless you. Come on up, Brian. What I want to share with you is a year ago, we asked if there were full-time missionaries, full-time couples or uh, individuals that would want to go to Michigan, to Maine, to, to go do full-time missionary work. And we set funds aside, too, as a conference to be able to do that. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to find those individuals. That opportunity is still open. I still throw that out there for you. The thing, though, that I want to tell you about that was so encouraging was this last year, uh, I got a call from Jason Anderson, and 
he was going to Maine. Him and his wife, Colburn Road, had approved sending two missionary teams, one to the Pacific Northwest, which we also said we needed help in, and the other was to Maine. And so I was so touched by that I thought, well, what could Missionary Branch do where I attend? And we approved sending missionary teams out once a quarter someplace. What I'm sharing with you is what can your congregation do? Maybe we can't go and send full-time missionaries out right now. I certainly think we could, but maybe we can't. And so what can we do? Could your congregation say we could send uh, a team that maybe could go what I'd really like to do, like what Jason and, and his wife did. They came up there for like 10 days. We were able to cover a couple of different branches. We went one Sunday at one place. We visited all week long. We finished up a series at the next place. And so if your congregation, and it could even be in your region, like we're talking about in Michigan or, or wherever, if your congregation could send somebody to some of these uh, other areas, maybe they stay for uh, just 10 days. You know, what, what is it that your congregation can do? I believe as Brother um, Anderson shared on Monday, how tithing was supposed to be used. There is no reason that missionary boards should be struggling for funds when we have tithing that is being used for local stuff. I'm sorry, it's not how it's supposed to be. And so if, the, if tithing could be sent to be able to support missionary efforts that's going on, if congregations could say, yes, we could send somebody one time a year, just we'll send this couple for 10 days, can we not do that? These are some very practical things that we can do. I think that would really help. So I wanted to thank Colburn Road for uh, taking that upon themselves and, and setting an example there. And so let's see how many more we can get. If we can reach out to Tom and say, our congregation too can send one or two or four or whatever you can do. The more we go outward and more we become that outward thinking church i think the more we're going to find a great success so thank you very much i'd like to give doug a minute first we're going to flip like a and then and then uh we'll go to dale doug you want to come up and talk a little bit about it um all of africa and kenya So you want all of Africa well, and Kenya? <laughs> Africa's a really big place. <laughs> and there's lots of people that need, need the gospel. Um, I have the opportunity right now of, of being one of those full-time missionaries talking about. Um, we're over in Kenya in a place called Awasi, close to Kasumu, which is by the lake. And we're at the Mildred Smith Mission Health Center. And so we have a outpatient clinic that um, we're able to be a part of there. And it really is in answer to the Lord's call, you know, that when you see someone who needs something, that if it's within your ability to help them, that you need to do it. And that really has been the blessing that it has been to be, to have the clinic there. Um, it's, it's really a unimaginable situation um, in terms of the health care um, that people don't have there. Um, and most of it is because of poverty, but also it's because of corruption. It's also because of just a lack of medical ethics amongst the, the people that are there. And so we find that we have a, um, a opportunity not just to provide uh, quality medical care to people who need it, but also to try to influence the whole um, ethos of medical care and trying to help people to see it a different way of doing um, uh, medicine and a different way of, of actually helping people. I had a call from a medical student who is um, actually going to be working for the clinic once he gets out of medical school, but he called just to say, you know, 
he'd been working with the people at the at the school and one of the things he recognized was the difference between what we were doing and what everyone else was doing was that our top priority was what is best for the patient and he was just saying i just don't i don't see that anywhere else in the in the system that they're working in so I just share some testimonies about what's been going on. So Monday through Friday, we're at the clinic. Um, uh, we have uh, so many people who come in who've been misdiagnosed or been treated for things that they don't have and uh, that we're able to give them a proper diagnosis and give them proper treatment. The other thing that we do is we do preventive medicine on the wall. We have the Word of Wisdom uh, printed out, and we go over that with everybody who comes in. Um, we don't call it the Word of Wisdom, but um, if they look up at the wall, they'll see that it's, it's exactly what we're talking about. But we also have the opportunity to pray with every patient, and we ask them, would you mind? Our statement is, we know that we offer things to help cure, but we know that God is the one who heals. Would you mind if we pray with you? I have not had one patient yet who said, no, I don't want to be prayed for. And so we have prayer with every patient that, that comes in and that we try to treat. And then on the weekends, we're able to uh, just be a part of the missionary work. And um, that has been the, uh, another blessing that we have. Just, I mean, share a testimony. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Nicholas lives in a town close to a Yugi's. He was an alcoholic, um, was having a terrible time with his family, with uh, just the issues that were going on. And um, because of his d despair, he decided one night to commit suicide. And he was going to pour gasoline on himself and on his business and just burn everything up because he was so despondent. And he actually bought the gasoline, poured it on himself, poured it on the on the stuff in his store where he had the his store and but then something said to him you know if you if you light yourself on fire right now it's going to spread to other people and the other people are going to be hurt and so he decided that he wouldn't he'd wait till evening wait till it was nighttime when other people weren't around and then he'd go ahead and light the fire but while he was there something said to him go and visit your nephew and his nephew is a gentleman named Elijah and Elijah has single-handedly started six congregations just by going to places where he knows people and sharing the gospel with them. And uh, a voice told him to go visit Elijah, and so he left his place and started walking. It took him five days to get there, and he was just, he didn't bring any food, he didn't bring any money, he didn't bring anything with him. And he, uh, the first night that he fell down, he went to sleep, and uh, he woke up and he was by a garbage pit that someone had set on fire, and yet he wasn't burned. And after three days, he hadn't had any food to eat, and he said, how can I get food? What can I do? And he saw a lady who was getting on a matatu, a, a transportation, one of those places like, and um, she was looking on the ground, and then she got in and left. He said, well, maybe she was looking for money. So we went over, and sure enough, on the ground, he found 20 shillings, and so he was able to have a little tea that day as he made his way to his nephew's house. So five nights later, he got to his, the nephew's house, and um, Elijah was down at the school. He works at a Tenzion college, and, uh, or in, in school there. And uh, so his wife called and said, hey, your nephew's here, and something's wrong. And he said, well, just... Just keep him around. I'll, I'll be home sometime. We can see what's going on. So she let him stay there at the house. And on the third day, it was time for Sunday. And so he, she told him that he was going to church with her. And so he said, okay. He went to church. And uh, the pastor there, a gentleman named Wilson Oyata, uh, preached a sermon that he said for the first time in his life, it gave him hope. And so he kept going to church. They have church about every day at, uh, at uh, Rakwara, where they are. And so every day he was able to be there. But because of that support, he was also able to quit drinking. And he didn't have any alcohol from the day that he arrived at, uh, at uh, his nephew's house. After This was in February when he left. By April, he had decided he needed to be baptized. And so he was baptized. After his baptism, he realized that He'd really done his family wrong. I mean, he had walked off and not said anything and had not had any contact with his family, his wife, his children, um, since he left. And so 
He felt bad about that, so he started sending money on the phone. He'd gotten a job and uh, working with as a shepherd for a local person there. So he started sending money to his wife. So she knew he was alive because money kept appearing in her account, but they hadn't talked to anybody. Time went on, and around September, we had a, a weekend where we went and did a, a little mini retreat um, at the congregation there. And on Saturday, we had classes. We talked about the ordinances of the church. And as he was listening to that class on the ordinances, he said he realized that God was a part of everything in our life. And that because God was a part of everything in his life, God was also part of his family life. And that he needed to do something more with his family. Well, the next class was on reconciliation. And he recognized that there was a very vast need for him to somehow go back to his family. The next day was Sunday. They had a communion service. And at the time before the communion, of course, we have that time when we need to examine ourselves and to look at the things in our life and make them right. And he didn't at that time, but he said, I'm going to take the communion, but tomorrow I'm going to call my wife. And so he fasted all day Sunday into Monday, and he called his wife first time he'd spoken to her since February. His wife was cool, but was able to talk, and uh, he asked her if there was to be any possibility that he might return. She didn't shut down the possibility, so they continued in talking, and by mid-October, I got a call from uh, Legion. He said, hey, Nicholas is getting ready to go home. Can you come take him? So we have a land cruiser that's our, our ambulance our, um, that we use for the, for the clinic. And so I brought the land cruiser up and we were going to take Wilson, the pastor, and Elijah and Nicholas back to his house for his reunion. Well, when he got there, the congregation said, we want to come too. And I said, well, uh, they said, how many can you hold? <laughs> I said, well, as long as I've got room to drive, you guys can get as many as you can as you want. So I think it's a record that I haven't seen since then. We had 17 people uh, crammed into the Land Cruiser. And we made it on the roads all the way to Yugi's. Arrived at Nicholas's home and came in. And as we shared with the family, Nicholas began with his, with his apology, with his repentance. His wife said, you know, he told me two things. He said he wanted to come back. And he said he was changed. He said he'd, he'd become a Christian. She said, we didn't believe it. Um, he'd been all kinds of things before, but mostly an alcoholic and a, and a liar. And he said he'd found this church family. And she said, we didn't know it was a cult. We didn't know what it was. But she said, seeing your whole congregation come and support him today, we know that there must be something there. And so as he continued to share with his family and they saw the love of Jesus Christ manifested in this gentleman's life and how he was changed, how he's been sober since February of last year, had a call two weeks before uh, we came here and they wanted to have us go back up and on Saturday they wanted to have some classes and on Sunday they want to have baptisms for Nicholas's family, for his brothers, for some neighbors. We got there on Saturday and our class was on life after death and there was a gentleman there that I didn't know. It turned out that he was a local man who decided to come, and he'd heard there was a cult that was coming to town. So he was going to come, and he was going to flush it out. He was going to sell everything that was wrong with it. Had the classes that we had on Saturday, went in the evening, had more classes, again, classes on some reconciliation and forgiveness, classes on the gospel. Went till 2 o'clock in the morning, Next morning, as we got ready for the baptismal service, the man who'd come to uh, show how wrong it was asked to be baptized with 12 others. We had 13 baptisms that day. What a blessing. 
The Lord could take the despair of an alcoholic man who was ready to end it all and turn it into a new congregation in a Yugi's. Share one other, there's a lady, a little village outside of Kasuma called Kaluja, and uh, she'd been, or not, she was just from, from the area around. She'd been talking to Ellie um, Okecha, one of the elders there, and he'd kind of invite her to church. And so she came to church one Sunday. And after that Sunday, we'd had a, a baptism and some people. And so she came back several times, and actually she'd come back four times over the course of a, of a few weeks. And uh, one Sunday she came, and we were getting ready to leave the service, and, and she said, well, aren't we going for baptism? And we said, no, not really. Well, every Sunday that she'd been there for the four times she'd come, there'd always been a baptism. There were eight young people from the congregation had been baptized, and then there were the next time she came, there was about six from a little village called Kaluja that had been baptized, and then the next time there had been a family out in Awasi that uh, hadn't been baptized yet, and so they came in, and we had a baptismal service after the, after the service. So every time she came to church, she thought there was baptism. So she'd brought her clothes. She was ready to be baptized that day, but we didn't have any have a baptism for her, so we were able to arrange that for her for the next week. Brothers and sisters, the, the gospel is such... A blessing for everyone in this world. And it's going forward. And sometimes we get concerned about our little things that were going on here and there and what somebody's doing, what somebody else is doing. What the Lord is doing is so much greater than anything that we can even imagine. And it has just been a, a blessing and a pleasure to be a part of that work. Brother Dale? I kind of like this. I, don't feel, I like this, like domestic, international, domestic, international. Wasn't planned that way, but kind of works with my head. I'll try to make this uh, fairly short. Uh, I've been on the African Restoration Ministries Board probably 20 years, maybe. I forgot, lost track. And one thing I've observed, and this is maybe a little bit of chastisement, is that when a community needs a well built or a family has lost members because of a fire or a flood, the saints just overwhelmingly give. But when it comes to supporting missionaries, for some reason, we're reluctant to give and support the missionary work. And we're talking about saving souls not just building, rebuilding houses or restoring property or things. Those things are important. But let's not forget the reaching out to souls. Is Chris Capps online? He was here yesterday. I want to share just a brief testimony that he allowed me to share at our congregation that happened in Rwanda. And I'll make it short. I may not have the exact, everything exactly perfect, but I think you'll get the idea. They were having a lot of trouble registering the church in Rwanda. And uh, finally, the government says you've got to own property or building to worship in. And we can't register unless that gets done. I'm, short, I'm shortening this down, but basically, they finally got that accomplished. And then the government come back and said, no, you've got to have curriculum to train your priesthood. You cannot register the church until that happens. And they went through a bunch of loops like that. I may not have it all exactly, but I just wanted to relate this testimony, how the Lord works over a period of time. Well, I believe in 2022, uh, Brother Capps was on a missionary trip in Rwanda, and they had to go to a place where they couldn't use uh, public transportation, so they flagged down, I don't know if the cab or uh, private transportation, they flagged somebody down to take them. And it turns out this gentleman they took, uh, the pastor there, and I don't know if it was Nestor. I'm not sure who the presiding elder is there that he was talking with. But basically, they started, and when uh, they drove to this place, they started talking to him about the gospel. And the big hang-up he had was being rebaptized. And after visiting with him several times, uh, Chris talked to him, and he finally came to the conclusion that it was, he needed to be rebaptized, And so he consented to that, and, and whoever the pastor was there, 
uh, was talking to him about being, he was willing to be rebaptized. And the, the gentleman he was talking to that was willing to be baptized, he said, you know what I do for a living? And I think it was Lester or Nestor, I'm not sure. Has somebody been to Rwanda here? Huh? Okay. Anyway, he said, you know what I do for a living? And he said, no. He says, I work for the government and I'm responsible for establishing churches and registering churches for the government. And so they're just about, I think they're either registered now or they're just about is, but the Lord had this all in hand and he's moving like that in all these countries. And there's a tremendous work that's going forth. And I just urge you to support the missionary endeavors in these countries. And the last thing, uh, we need board members. Yeah. We only have six out of nine. So if you have an interest of, of, of helping with the work or help sending missionaries, or if you're willing to go, let us know. I want to thank everyone for sharing. And just remember the Great Commission is you go. If you can't go, you send. Thank you. My dad and I leave for Germany uh, uh, here in a, another week or two, week, I guess, uh, Mar April 24th. We come back the 6th of, of uh, May. Uh, brother. Uh, Just like to uh, recommend all of the missionaries, uh, advise them that the uh, children's books that uh, my wife uh, produced and published are available to them at no cost. Anybody doing any missionary work in this country or in any other countries can have all the uh, children's books they want. They're being used in uh, various countries, uh, uh, courtesy of uh, Doug and Eric. There are uh, five uh, sets going to Kenya very soon, and uh, I'm glad to provide those. Plus, we have some funds that we can help uh, with the shipping on that. So. Uh, Please contact me if you can use some of the children's books. Thank you very much, Bob. We're, go ahead. Just a quick testimony. So what we do is at the clinic, we put out one of Bob's book or Barrel's books, uh, out on the clinic table for people who are in the waiting room. And uh, so we you know, switch them up every once in a while because there's, there's eight books. And um, so our guard was there, and he began to wonder if he could look at one of those books. And so we said, sure. So he was looking at the books, and eventually he was baptized. But he said, you know, I'm taking this, I'm going back to my family. Can I, can I take some of these with me? You said, sure, we've got the whole set. So we sent the whole set back with him, and he was, he was uh, sharing the gospel out of those books. And so it's a, it's a wonderful blessing, particularly for people. If, if the English isn't the best, the books are simple, but it's the gospel. Thank you. Yeah, we're taking two sets with us to Germany also. We're going to take a, just a, a five-minute break or so here, and uh, then Eric and uh, Marlon are going to uh, lead us in our last session. And uh, this is a session I'm really looking forward to. And uh, so please uh, just come back here as soon as you can, and uh, we'll get started again. <laughs>